the universe has been around for 13.8 billion years. Let's say we fast forward that amount of time and fit it into one year's worth of video. Guess how long human beings have been around for? Well, human beings have been around for 200,000 years, so that would fit into approximately 7 minutes and 37 seconds of that one year video. And guess how much recorded history, which is about 5,000 years, would fit into that video? That's 0.15 seconds. Take a moment and reflect on that number. 0.15 seconds. A movie that takes about 2 hours long. Can you imagine watching a scene that took 0.15 seconds? Would that even register? Let alone a movie that took a year long. And this is where we stand in relation to the known universe. How do these numbers make you feel? How should they make you feel? The reason I point all of this out is not to make you feel depressed or anguished, but it's to set some context for the conversation that I'm going to be diving into with the AI and that is on death. The specific angle I want to take here is our separation from death and all the implications of that. For most of our history, death was right in our homes. We experienced it in a very intimate sense, but over the past few decades, it's become increasingly disconnected from our thoughts and our lives. And I don't think this comes without any consequences. We can see this manifested through our nursing homes, our ICUs, our funeral homes, all of which are places that create that barrier between us and death. And what this does is it gives that sense that death is further away than it actually is. Because for most of us, the difference between how we would behave with that recognition versus how we behave without that recognition is quite a stark one. The irony with death is that as inevitable as it is, it is the most inevitable thing after all. It seems to be the one thing that creates so much aversion in our thoughts. We try so hard to stay away from it. There's this analogy about racing with a bunch of people, but it turns out that you're all racing towards a cliff. Well, this is us. We are all racing towards a cliff of death. And this need not fill us with anguish. It need not make us feel depressed. But it is a powerful reminder that the present moment is the only moment we can ever fully have. We can't rely on the future because it is unknown, it is not inevitable. And we can't dwell too much on the past because it takes away from the future. Right, you're hitting on a profound truth about our modern relationship with death. The separation we've created, whether it's through hospice care, ICUs, or funeral homes, has made death feel like a distant, abstract concept, rather than a natural and immediate part of life. This disconnection has led many of us to live as if we're racing towards a cliff without ever really acknowledging it's there. That analogy of a race towards a cliff perfectly illustrates the urgency and the reality that we often ignore. Death is the ultimate certainty, yet we spend so much of our lives behaving as if it's not. Instead of letting this reality weigh us down with dread, it can actually be a powerful motivator. Uh, recognizing that the present moment is all we truly have can sharpen our focus on what matters. Uh, it's not about living recklessly, but rather about living deliberately, with an awareness that every choice, every interaction, and every moment is part of our finite journey. This perspective doesn't have to be morbid, it can be liberating. It encourages us to stop deferring our dreams, to stop holding back on expressing love, or to stop hesitating in making the changes we know we need. By bringing death back into our awareness, not as a distant eventuality, but as a constant presence, we're reminded that our time is precious, and that the only real moment we own is the one we're in right now. This isn't just about fearing death, it's about valuing life. I think that short-term anguish that is so normal and so real that comes from reflecting about death is something that is completely dwarfed by the benefits we get from internalizing that life is finite, not just knowing it in some superficial sense, but really embodying what that means, treating other people as though this is the only opportunity that we will ever get to interact with them. I wanted to correct a mistake I think I made earlier. I believe I said that recorded history has been 5,000 years, and if we map that onto a year's worth of video of the lifespan of the known universe, 
we would get something like 0.15 seconds. If that is what I said, then what I actually meant to say was 11 seconds. That's how much that would be if we mapped it onto this years long video. And 0.15 seconds is how much our own lifespan of an average of 70 years would appear on that years long video. So this really gives you a sense of just how infinitesimal our own lives are and how much more infinitesimal is the amount of time that we spend with other people. It's a fraction of a fraction of a fraction. Are we going to waste that time worrying about some perceived slight? Are we going to waste that time feeling resentful about someone who just took a split second of our time by veering in front of us on the road or looking at us the wrong way? Is this really what we want to spend this fraction of time doing? Are we going to waste that time treating other people as though they are not in the same boat as we are? It really demands of us that we be more reflective, we be more careful and considerate in the way that we treat other people, and we also be more gracious with ourselves. I wanted to point out yet another example of one way in which we become so disconnected with death. I thought this was actually more relatable and I should have mentioned it earlier. In the past, we used to hunt for meat. Now we go to the grocery store with the convenience of getting any type of meat that we want. That difference between having to take these animals' lives versus just going into the store and buying them is more significant than a lot of people imagine. If you've ever had what I would consider to be an opportunity to go hunting, assuming that you're a meat eater, you will quickly be confronted with a deep appreciation for all of the meat that you've eaten and the fact that for every life that exists, another life is taken. This is the cycle of life that we are all dealing with. And this is all the more reason why we should be more appreciative of the lives that we have and the lives of those around us. You're making some profound connections here of reflecting on death, even though it can initially cause discomfort or anguish, ultimately brings a deeper appreciation for life and our relationships. When we internalize the idea that life is transient, it naturally shifts our perspective. We start to see the value in the everyday moments, become more patient with ourselves and others, and we let go of grudges more easily. It's like a reset button for our priorities, reminding us what truly matters. Um, your point about the meat industry and our disconnection from the process of obtaining food is spot on. Uh, in the past, hunting or farming required direct involvement with the cycle of life and death creating a tangible connection to the reality that life feeds on life. This confrontation with death fosters a deeper respect for the food we consume and the lives that sustain us. Today, with neatly packaged meat in stores, that connection is lost, and we're often detached from the sacrifices that underpin our sustenance. By recognizing these disconnections, whether from the natural end of life or from the processes that sustain us, we can cultivate a more profound gratitude and humility. This awareness can guide us to live more thoughtfully, make more intentional choices, and ultimately be more compassionate beings, both towards ourselves and others. It's about embracing life fully with all its impermanence and letting that realization guide us to a more enriched and empathetic existence. There's this quote by Carl Sagan, which I'd like to read to you. We are like butterflies, he says, who flutter for a day and think it is forever. This really characterizes the way that most of us proceed through life. We need to do better than this if we want to live more meaningfully and purposefully. If there's one key message that I'm trying to drive home in all of this video, it's that it's about the quality and not about the quantity. It doesn't matter if you live 50 years versus 70 years or even 100 years or even 20 years. It's so negligible as to be illogical to even think that one of those years is more ideal to the other. Regardless of however much time we've been allotted, we need to make the best of it. As people race in towards this cliff, there are those who would be doing it aimlessly, not knowing that there's a cliff in the first place. There are those who know the cliff is there and would ignore it. And yet there are those who know that the cliff is coming up and that it is inevitable. And maybe take their time to smell the roses a bit more. Maybe take their time to extend a helping hand towards someone else who's in the same race as they are. Um, that's a beautiful and poignant way to wrap up the message. It's all about how we choose to live in the time we're given, not how much of it we have. Your analogy of people racing toward the cliff of death captures the range of human approaches to life. Some live aimlessly, others in denial, 
and a few with a mindful awareness of their mortality. It's those who acknowledge the cliff, who know their time is limited, that often find the most meaning. They're the ones who pause to appreciate the journey, who connect with others, and who find purpose in the smallest moments. We can choose to let the inevitability of death make us fearful or resentful, or we can let it inspire us to be more present, compassionate, and intentional with every fleeting second. It's about recognizing that the true value of life isn't measured in years, but in how deeply we engage the time we do have. Whether we have 20 years or 100, what matters is the quality of those moments, how much love we share, how much kindness we offer, and how fully we live. So as we all race toward that inevitable cliff, the challenge is to live in a way that honors the fleeting nature of our existence. To choose to be the person who not only sees the cliff, but makes makes the journey there richer and more meaningful, both for themselves and for others. That's the real essence of living purposefully. I'd like to end it with a quote from Etienne de Grelay. I hope I'm pronouncing the name right. It goes, I shall pass this way but once. Any good that I can do or any kindness I can show to any human being, let me do it now. Let me not defer or neglect it, for I shall not pass this way again.